Net44 and IPv6 on your station via VPN starting now. Hey, good afternoon. This is the next installment of the Tapper Digital Communications Conference, a topic of bringing IPv6 and Net44 to your station via VPN given to us by John Hayes, K7VE. This was a very interesting topic and something I had not heard of before with Net44. So, so if you're into IT at all with DMR, DSTAR, System Fusion, Arden Mesh Networking, anything about amateur radio over the internet, this might be an interesting topic for you. I hope you enjoy the episode. Next up, John Hayes, K7VE. His talk is bringing Net44 and IP version 6 to your station via VPN. Take it away, John. Thank you very much. Good morning. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, I'm John Hayes, as was mentioned. I've spoken at a couple of these before. Um, you'll see throughout the presentation QR codes. If you know how to use them, they'll give you the links to the various things I'm talking about. So um, I'll try to leave them up there long enough to get it. Uh, this particular one uh, takes you to a group's I.O. group. Um, on Net44 VPNs. Um, there's a wiki there uh, which has the step-by-step -step that we're going to go through uh, and in the files section you can get this presentation if you need it before it shows up on the Tapper site. So, uh, uh, so um, part of this I uh, spoke at DCC 2012 in Atlanta. Who was there? Okay, so I'm a little grayer. I have a little more girth. But we talked about Net44 back then, and Net44 had kind of been a sleeper for a while. And one of the things that I promoted was we should BGP subnets of Net44 out so that they could be reached from the internet. And we wouldn't be dependent on a bunch of old files that got passed around and downloaded and uploaded and stuff like that. And we've seen some movement on that in the last six years. I didn't realize how long it had been until I sat down and started putting this slide together. So one of the things that I, and the uh, QR code will take you to the video of that talk, so you can see if I'm still telling the truth. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out was that uh, we have this, this Net44, which is what we call an old class A or a slash eight allocation. How much is that worth? It's not billions. Give me a couple of bids here. Okay, so last week I gave this presentation in Seattle and the guy from Amazon that buys IP addresses for Amazon came up to me and said, that's worth $300 million if you want to sell it. And I said, well, we're using it for stuff. <laughs> but we're not using it for $300 million worth of stuff, so you guys all need to start using it, okay? Because if we're going to keep a $300 million asset for ham radio, we should use it. Just like we should be using our frequencies so that they don't go away, right? So let's do that. Brian, where are you? Brian Cantor. Right back there. Mr. Cantor manages the overall network. And then there are local managers. Uh, I do it for Western Washington, and there's probably some other people here. So um, we'll... Uh, the purpose of this presentation is if you're not in a situation where you, say like at the university, your university might take a section of Net44 and advertise it to the rest of the internet, and then you, you can use it for ham activities, okay? Some of us don't have that kind of a resource, so I want to show you a way to do it. And this is going to be a step-by-step, -step, and I promise 
that'll be real boring, but I'll skip over those parts, okay? So get the slide set so that you can, you can follow through uh, after the, after the uh, presentation. So there's a lot of applications you can do. I run a number of websites that uh, are ham radio specific. Net 44 can only be used for amateur radio activities, whether that's infrastructure, website would be infrastructure, or actually on-air experimentation and so on. So uh, here's one that I have. This is the, uh, the dashboard for my D-Star repeaters, multiple repeaters. And it's actually on Net44, and you can either go to the domain name nw7dr.amper.org. There's actually a couple other domain names that get it there. Or you can go to its IP address, and uh, that's a good application for uh, Net44. I run a number of them. Um, on DSTAR, you can actually run DSTAR on HF, unlike many of the uh, digital voice modes, uh, Kodak 2 being the other one. Um, and I run websites for both of those, both uh, Codec 2 and DSTAR, and uh, those are going to migrate to Net44 right now. They're on my personal Class C network, uh, but those are the kinds of things you can put up there. So here's an application. You have, you live in an apartment. But you got a summer cabin that has internet connectivity, so you put your station at the cabin out in the woods where the noise floor is lower. Even me, at my house, I have a S9 noise floor on almost all HF bands. Higher on some. Two meters, it almost wipes out the band for me. I don't know what all it is. We are a legal grow state for marijuana. Maybe it's the marijuana farms in people's basements or something. But uh, really noisy. So I bought a piece of land that I'm hoping to build a house on in the next couple of years across the water, and the noise floor is clear in the basement. So, um, and the other good thing is the water table is really high, so I'll have a really good ground there. Um, there's a couple of contest stations nearby that do really well there. But anyway, so if you have Net44, you can put a uh, computer to control your station at the station location, and you can go over Net44 to control it. Now, you could do this over the open Internet, too, but one of the things we're going to discover as we discuss here is sometimes you want to do multiple things at the same location. And if you're only using one public IP address, you can only use a port once. So if you're running a website on port 80, you can do some tricks inside of a web server to get around it, but you can only have one web server. But if you have a block of addresses on Net44, you can assign an address to each web server, okay? Or your station, or other applications. Now this is one that uh, is handy. I know I brought it here. There it is. Too many pockets, not enough hands. So this is a router. The interesting thing about this router is not only will it bridge inter uh, Ethernet or Wi-Fi either direction, you can also put a SIM card in it and run it on the LTE network. Okay, and so um, I know of several locations uh, in my area where we have repeaters on mat mountaintops that have no internet connected to them, but they're beautifully in the LTE footprint. Okay, so uh, you put one of these in the repeater site, and now you have internet to your repeater for control, for linking, for whatever functions you want to do up there. And in fact, in the Seattle area where I am, we have something called HamWAN, which is 
a uh, uh, 5 gigahertz microwave system that keeps growing and growing and growing and provides multi-megabit data on net 44 and they're hooking repeaters up to it for both com command and control and for linking but there's occasionally a place where this doesn't exist and we could put the a little router like this now you're saying well LTE that's on a carrier network and that's going to cost me some money yes that's true but if you look at the data rates that you have to do for some of these things they're not too bad and I'll put a little plug in for uh, Google Fi here because I use it Google Fi is a telephone service that they don't advertise but it's out there uh, your telephone service costs you twenty dollars a month your data is ten dollars a gigabyte but once you hit sixty dollars they don't charge you for any additional so for eighty dollars a month you've got a phone line and you've got unlimited data and it rolls off of three characters carriers it's on t-mobile mostly in my neighborhood sprint and u.s cellular i believe is the third one um, and the beauty of that is that uh, uh, while they don't charge you above uh, six gigabytes uh, it does roll off at about 15 gigabytes but I never hit those those levels with the sites the other thing is is the sim chips to go in these once you get the phone they give you up to nine sim chips free to put in into routers and and uh, tablets and computers and that kind of thing so it's a really a pretty good deal for those kinds of applications the other thing you can use these for who in here is on D star few of you how many are on DMR I'm sorry um, a lot of the we can go into that long political discussion some other time uh, I, the uh, the popular thing is to have a hotspot. How many have hotspots? So, if you've got a hotspot, and this is very popular with people that do uh, commercial truck driving, is they'll take them and put them in their truck, and then they'll use their 50 watt radio to talk to this little box and go out over their cell phone out to the network. Well, replace it with this. Um, the second advantage it gives you is you now have a fixed IP address or IP range in your vehicle. So you can actually address things inside your vehicle from the internet. Okay, so a lot of applications that can come out of that. Even more applications. Telemetry, the internet of things, uh, all-star echo link, uh, another place that you could use this uh, get it out to the repeater site get it to a node somewhere else uh, APRS uh, I gating DMR D star and so on you like that repeater site up there okay I picked that picture on purpose uh, that's at Farnsworth Peak Utah anyone know why it's called Farnsworth Peak it's the main television site. Why would they pick the name Farnsworth? Silo T. Farnsworth, Idaho farmer boy, right? Invented the uh, method of rasterized imaging that is used in television. Okay. Anyway, it's a manned site, believe it or not. <laughs> there are people that actually stay in those buildings year around, and they have internet to the site. And there are a few D-Star repeaters and that type of thing up there. But they didn't want them being on the, the company internet because they didn't want uh, it to be breached and to get into other systems that are up at that site, commercial systems. However, if you use the technology we're talking about here, you could VPN out from there. They'll support that. And then you have Net44 for as many addresses as you need up in the repeater site for various control and operational functions. It's a great site. It covers uh, most of those repeaters up there uh, on a bad day can cover about a hundred miles on handheld. 
Okay, so where do you get your Net44 addresses? You go to this portal.amper.org QR code and you request them. Okay? And what happens when you go there is you create an account. Anyone here never created an account on a website before? <laughs> so you do that. This is going to be really important. We're going to talk about it more here in a second. Then you're going to go to this page and find out where the local uh, IP address range is for your geographic area. Okay? So in my case, Western Washington, you see K7VE there. I am the administrator for that section of Net44. And it's Western Washington. And so all of our addresses start with 44.24 and then go from there. And so within that, you'll go in and you'll see there are uh, ranges that have been shared with people. You see a couple there for Hamwen and, and one for San Juan Co County. Uh, Brian Hoyer walking around in the background there lives up on this. How many islands? 178? 170-something islands in a county, 20-some uh, odd are inhabited. The, the rest have rabbits and deer on them. Um, but uh, they're trying to tie together uh, all of their emergency communications, uh, infrastructure, and so on uh, for the ham side of things. And so they have about 1,000 addresses to do that, which gives the total population about 10 or 16 a piece, uh, but anyway, when you're there, if there isn't one already allocated that you would get on, then you click on the the link right there to request that you be assigned some. And you go into the portal, and for what we're talking about here, you're going to request a range of at least a slash 24. Um, and is it on this screen? I have really bad eyesight, so I've got to come back here for a second. And can't read it here either. Uh, but basically, you're going to say, this is going to be a direct connection to the Internet. That's what we call sections that BGP out and the rest of the Internet knows about them. And do your coordinator a favor. Tell them what you're going to use the addresses for. Because I get these, and there's nothing in there, and... The guys asked for 45,000 addresses. I want to know why. <laughs> what on God's green earth are you doing that you need 45,000 hosts for? And if you have a good reason, then in that particular case, I'd probably contact Brian Cantor and say, mm, these guys need their own slash 16 because they're doing something crazy. Uh, Hamwan is a good example of that. So, you're going to submit that, and I'm going to review it, or your equivalent. And then, because it's direct, as soon as I say, okay, they're going to get a slash 24, and the prefix is this, 44242040, then Brian gets an email, Brian Cantor, and he sends you some paperwork where you explain how you're going to connect to the rest of the internet. And he's going to need some information. And in the particular example I'm giving here, uh, this is the information that he needs. Uh, this particular company, they have what's called an autonomous system uh, network uh, number, which is that six digits there. The name of the provider how you contact them. And then he's going to prepare a letter that authorizes that network provider to advertise your address space. Okay? So when I gave this talk six years ago, we didn't have some of these details, so I wanted to work it all out so we could come here and you guys could all go home with the tools you need to do it.
So, I'm going to use Spartan Host as an example. There are other places that do it. In fact, there's a link uh, out of the group uh, with a spreadsheet. But these guys are pretty good. They, uh, they have data centers in uh, Seattle, and I think they have one in, uh, tech in Texas somewhere. Uh, even though they're based in the UK, that's where their data centers are. Uh, I picked the $5 plan. Um, it's pretty reasonable. You get, uh, um, you know, a gig of RAM and uh, uh, some disk space, and you can transition over a terabyte of data over their network uh, for $5 a month. Not too bad. Okay. So you set that account up. Again, you have to fill out a form. Everyone here's filled out a form on the web before, right? You tell them how you're going to pay for the first one. You can actually deposit some funds so that they don't send you, so that you don't have to send them mon monthly deposits. So put thirty dollars in, and you're good for the next six months. They'll just decrement it five dollars a month, kind of thing. Uh, as part of the setup process, you're telling them you want a virtual private server and you need to tell them what operating system you want to install. I usually use Ubuntu 64-bit and there's a newer version, but I use 16.04. You select the default for the rest of the, the values here, basically. And as soon as you pay them, they provision that virtual private server. So you have a Linux server sitting in a data center. This particular data center is in the Weston building in Seattle. For those of you that know internet topology, that's a major node. They are right next to what's called SIX. SIX is the Seattle Internet Exchange. All the major carriers plug into this big rack of switches up there, and so do they. So you have really good connectivity to the rest of the world from there. One of the options they have when you set it up, it's not mandatory, but I recommend it, is you can have two-factor authentication whenever you want to modify your setup with them. And the way they do it is there's an application called the Google Authenticator that you download to your smartphone and when you go to log in you log in and it asks for your Google Authenticator uh, number and so you open up your smartphone and it gives you a six-digit number that changes once a minute and you put that six-digit number in and then it lets you in that way someone can't sniff your uh, password and get in sir Yeah, yeah, the service is available on Android, it's available on iOS, I think it may even be on WatchOS. WatchOS is Apple's watch operating system. Okay, so once you're in and you're all set up, they have a control panel, you can turn on things like using VNC to get a graphical display into your machine. I'm a command line kind of guy, so I just open up an SSH session to it. Uh, you can see your utilization, you can, uh, you know, all the kinds of good things you'd want to know about your service. You can reload the operating system, be sure you've saved all of your files that you've modified so that you can put them back in. Um, you can power up, power down, whatever you want to do. I leave mine running 24-7 because it's a service and it only cost me five dollars a month. You can see the utilization. Here's um, a month's utilization that I have. I use two percent of the bandwidth that I'm permitted. And I'm running D-Star repeaters and websites and all kinds of stuff through it. So, um, pretty, pretty reasonable thing to do. So now we're going to get into the nits and grits and this is the boring part so I'll go through it pretty fast, but you can get it on, on the slides. So you're going to log in either through SSH or uh, on VNC. 
So the first thing you want to do is update the operating system. So you get all the patches, all the security fixes, and stuff like that, which isn't too bad because they keep their images pretty up to date. But you grab that one that just got submitted an hour ago and so on, and you do that by doing uh, an update and an upgrade with the apt-get command. And you'll be logged in as root, so you don't have to put sudo in front of it. Uh, Another change I highly recommend is go in and edit that file right there and change the uh, TCP port that SSH listens on. Because if you leave it on 22, you'll have kiddie scripts from all over the world hitting it continuously. And you just don't want that. It's just not fun, okay? And they're eating up your bandwidth and stuff like that. So change that. Um, you probably want to change the time zone as well. And that's the command to do that. And reboot to bring it all into uh, thing. And then we're going to um, turn that virtual private server into a router. So that it will pass traffic between networks. Okay, it's not hard. You go and edit this file right here, and you make these changes to it. Once those are in, then it knows how to route um, both IP version 4 and IP version 6 addresses. Now, your IPv4 Remember, we're going to apply for at least a slash 24, which is 256 addresses. Uh, uh, but this uh, virtual private server from these guys, they also allocate you a slash 64 on IPv6, which means you've picked up trillions <laughs> of IP addresses you can assign to things, right? And it now knows how to route those. You give the command syscontrol minus p, and it loads all of that up, and now it's a router. Next thing you're going to do is install your VPN server, which we're going to use OpenVPN. It's widely supported, widely known. So we have to install it. I like to add a special user account to run the VPN instead of running it under root. Just in case there was a leak, you're not getting into the rest of the operating system with super god powers. You're just going to have the powers that are allocated to that. Uh, there's a few commands or shell scripts that we're going to execute out of the VPN. We want to make those available to this account. So we edit uh, the sudoers file. And I reboot at that point just because I like seeing that it reboots in a couple seconds. Okay, so now you've got an op a, a VPN running, but you want to secure it. And so you're going to create a certificate, and this is called a, uh, an authority certificate, uh, that's going to be inside of that. So there's a file that we're going to use because we've got great scripts to help you make these, these certificates and install them and stuff like that. So you're going to go in and you're going to modify these as appropriate for your site. So U.S., New Mexico, Seguro, uh, whatever your club name is there, uh, a contact email and so on. And put that in and set the... Uh, key name to server. And you're just going to quickly go through this set of commands. There's great explanations of what they do. I'm not going to go into it because I'm boring you enough already. But basically this cleans it up. It builds the uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, um, segment. Uh, it builds the certificate authority. Uh, builds the key server for server, which we named up above. Uh, we generate keys. We go to the keys directory. And we copy all of these files over to etc. OpenVPN. Now, 
really sophisticated people actually run RSA on a separate machine uh, and then just copy them over, but we're trying to make this quick and easy. Okay, so now we have some scripts and support files we want to download from the Net44 VPN group. Uh, so we go to temp and we uh, pull them down from this directory and save them to temp. We unpack them, copy all of them to the proper directories, uh, make the shell scripts executable. And then we're going to do update some uh, variables to get the server to know what networks it's going to provide. And so the stuff in yellow here, you're going to change. The IPv6 uh, prefix is for the IPv6 uh, subnet that you've been given by your, your hosting company. You're going to put that in. We're going to, I like food and beef, that's pretty cool. Uh, your IPv6 network and the net mask for it. And then we're going to go to it set our open VPN and we're going to run this script. It's going to create a new configuration file. You're going to look at it and the first time it's not going to mean anything to it, but you're going to look at it and you're going to say, that looks right. <laughs> and you're going to copy it over. It's really not too bad if you, if you read through it. So we need to set up the tunnel on the server side. So we got another set of variables to input. Uh, the tunnel, we're going to give it a prefix of 112, which means you've got, uh, as I recall, 65,000 addresses. You're going to push through this particular tunnel out of your trillions of addresses. Um, set that all up. Uh, then we're going to start the server, the VPN server, and we're going to make sure it's running, and then we're going to enable for next boot. It just comes up automatically. You don't have to go in and manually start it. So whenever you're restarting your server, you're good. If you followed all of this correctly, you now have the server to serve out IP addresses for Net44 and the IPv6 lock that you have. The clients, this is the Raspberry Pi example. You can get, like for my MacBook, I download something called TunnelBlick. If you go to the openvpn.org, there's clients for Android and for Windows and everything else, but we'll do it here because I like playing with Raspberry Pis. Um, so I have to build a template that's based on those variables I did earlier. Um, and we put that in. And then for each client, we're going to generate a configuration for the client. This is on the server side. So we only have a few things that we need to put in. The username of the client. That might be your call sign, for example. Um, you're going to answer yes to two questions. And it's going to build this file, openvpn underscore whatever that you put in here, dot ovpn. Then you're going to go to the client, Raspberry Pi in this case. Again, we're going to have Raspbian installed. We're going to do the update and upgrade because we just love doing that so much. And then we need to install OpenVPN and the unzip utility because some of the files we bring in are zipped. We're going to go to that directory right there. We're going to SFTP that client file you just created on the server to the local machine. We're going to rename it, because I like doing that, to .conf. That's pretty cool. That works. Hasn't failed on me yet. Then you start up the client. And this is how you start up the client. 
uh, you tell it to read the config file that you just put in and run it as a daemon. That also puts it so it automatically restarts. You can see that it's assigned the addresses with that command, and you can see that it's in the list of interfaces for that particular host name. You now have an up and running tunnel with uh, 44 net addresses available to it and the client as well as your IPv6 range that you've sent to it. Now you can go back to the server because with what you've done there it will just assign the next available IP address out of your block but you might be running a server and you wanted it a specific IP address so you're gonna go back to the server and you're going to run this command right here and you're going to give it some values the name of the client the starting IP address the net mask and uh, the IPv6 and run that and it will put a file in CCD with the name of the user client it will look something like this we're going to restart the server so it all takes place. I think it actually will pick it up, but I like restarting things. It's fun. The clients all reconnect, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, you can watch what's going on by looking at the status log. Or there is a package you can install that will give you a web interface to watch who's connected and who's not connected and all of that good stuff. So, there's some caveats and considerations here. I personally en uh, encourage sharing an account and subnet, but that comes with some special responsibilities. Uh, one is, you have to keep your contact information on portalamp.org Ampl .org up to date because if we get a digital media takedown order or you're sharing kitty porn or whatever, since Brian Cantor is the uh, listed administrator for all of 44Net, he's going to get a notification. And he's got to get a hold of you. And if you don't have good information in there, it ain't going to happen easily. He's going to have to do a lot of extra work to try and figure out how to get a hold of you. Once one of those things happen, well, and periodically you need to make sure those things are not being used inappropriately, uh, have a process to revoke the certificate of any abuser so that they can't reconnect to the VPN until they clean up their act, uh, and or just stop routing to that subnet until things are better, okay? And you can do that all on the server. You don't have to go out to them and personally beat them all up. Um, it's really important that you install and maintain a good firewall. When you come into that Raspberry Pi, it's going to be on your local area network in your house or your data center or whatever. If they get into that over Net44, they can go out your LAN. So you want to really control where things go. So run a good firewall there. You can do some things with VLANs and that to help mitigate it, but uh, it's just good, safe computing. You know, in the old days, they used to say, you know, we had to do safe computing, we had Ethernet cables, and the way you kept viruses out is you put a condom on the end of it before you plugged it in. Safe computing. Always practice safe computing. Okay, Q&A. I've put you all to sleep. The big prize winner in the back corner. Thanks for the interesting brief on how to set up a VPN, but I, I, I missed something at the beginning. What is the reason why you want to do that? Ma mainly to get secure connectivity between the client and the server, or why not just connect directly from the client to your 44 dot address? I missed something. Okay, so what the 
VPN is running on is a machine that can route Net44 from the internet. Your consumer service, Comcast, Charter, whatever, is not going to route your 44 addresses for you. So the VPN allows you to pull part of Net44 into your shack and then you can use it. So the types of applications I was talking about at the course at the beginning. So that's what the VPN is doing is it's just bringing that chunk of net 44 as well as a bunch of IPv6 that you can then use within your own station. So uh, back in the 19, early 1980s I got some 44 addresses assigned to me by our local coordinator. Mm -hmm. Has that been carried forward or is that long gone? Do I have to start over? If you hear a big flushing sound, that happened a few years ago, um, largely because we've gone to this model where subnets are more the thing that you want. A and part of the problem with the old approach was, so it was designed during packet radio's heyday, and what I found in my area, and I've been the coordinator in different areas as I've moved around a bit. I've been kind of settled in Western Washington now for 10 years. Um, I had people for their mobile packet stations having IP addresses on every local LAN that they might pass through. And they would have to go in and manually change the IP address so that they could get into that local network. Using something like this is one approach uh, there are some other approaches that could be taken, but anyway, we cleaned up the database basically and um, are rebuilding it now through portal.amper.org. Portal.amper.org is your authoritative way to get IP addresses now. We Where, got one back here. Um, what is that modem that, or I'm sorry, router that you had? What model is that? Top secret. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You go to gl-inet, Google search for it, you'll see this, it's their MiFi, I forget the model name. And of course they don't write it on it. Uh, it's the 4G smart router. Um, in addition to the things that I listed before, uh, you can put a, uh, uh, an SD card in it and have a network uh, file store. Uh, you can plug USB type things into it. And what was that location? It runs again? Open WRT, and a lot of people are familiar with that as a as a router operating system. What was that location again? The name of the company? GL Golf Lima hyphen INET India November Echo Tango. You. You spoke. You spoke of, of the uh, of the service provider that you that you that you use. Are there alternatives? Yes. And 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 secondly, if I wanted to use a DNS server, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you said my local ISP won't route 44 traffic, but but if I have a DNS provider like Namecheap or my normal guy, will it? Can I can I set up a DNS that'll point point to a 44 address? Yes. Okay. Over here. So I have a VPS set up, mm -hmm. and then I get the open VPN so I can have a 44 route um, IP point to it. So now when I ping, let's say, my VPS's original IP versus that 44, is there going to be a lot of latency because it has to go to the 44 VPN and then back to my VPS? No, no. So the IP address that already belongs to the VPS is directly on whatever network it's hooked to. So it's going to ping directly to it. When you go through the VPN to the 44 range, yeah, you're going to get a little bit of delay. It just depends on how big the pipes are between you. Okay, so there's no way of assigning that 44 IP directly to my VPS. It has to be VPN through the uh, yeah, You can actually use some of the addresses on the VPS, and in fact, I do that. Okay. One or more. Cool. I, I did... What was the question that was asked here just before? Oh, DNS. Uh, one of the other things you should do is once you assign an IP address, contact your coordinator again 
and tell it a host name for it and that host name will be added to the Amper org domain as well as a reverse DNS record in the Amper org domain. So wh where was the next question? Uh, who, own, who owns network 44 and wh what's the source of the restrictions on usage on it? So the Amateur Radio Digital Corporation owns it and the CEO is right there. So the restrictions come into it because that's what was agreed to in the very beginning when we put the address space together. And uh, if they were abused, we will go to the effort to try and shut that portion down. Hi, John. Hi. Um, you know, you know our repeater on Rose Hill? Yeah. Uh, Right now, we use Sprint 4G up there for IRLP and control and, ec and echo link. What's, and that just gets, we just get us an IP from Sprint. Right. Is there an advantage to putting that on Net44? Uh, yes. Um, so you've got these different services. And right now, you've got a 220 repeater up there. And what else do you have? Right, so if you had reasons to want to get a control functions on those that were on the same port, like, you know, down at uh, Lincoln Center, we've got a bunch of weird IP port numbers mapped because we got multiple things running behind it. Uh, if we had Net44, each one of those boxes could have a 44 net IP address that you could address directly. The same thing up on Rose Hill. So, given that you have the Sprint modem already, if you installed the OpenVPN client up there, then you'd have a bunch of IP addresses that you could use at that site. That's about 15 miles from my house, so I know a little bit about it. Who's next? We're getting well, close to the end. We're out of time. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'll be around.